What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here, and I'm doing my best to stick to my guns and follow through with things I say I'm gonna finish. So even though Fandelver and Below Shattered Obelisk is out, as well as the Unarched Arcana, Tales of the Valiant stuff I need to work on and etc., I did promise I was gonna go back and do the monsters contained in Bigby's Glories of the Giants. Now there's over 75 monsters in this book, so there's no way I could do all of them in one video, because if I did, I'd probably start losing interest about halfway through, or as I started to get towards the end, I'd just be skipping to get through monsters. So we're gonna cover monsters A through F, which is still a sizable amount, so you're gonna wanna buckle up here. Uh, it's gonna be a long one. So we'll cover G through Z monsters in a future video. So if you're like me, we're talking about monsters and that obviously makes me think about encounters and probably one of my favorite things to deal with monster encounters and that is loot. But if you're also like me, you're a little disappointed with the options and the way things are handled in base fifth edition because they don't really tell you what loot monsters have unless it's in a pre-written module and it's a very specific item to a very specific creature. We'll enter the sponsor for today's video, Deck of Encounters and Loot, rollable tables from D&D from our friends over at Tome of Summoning. There's 11 days left as of me recording this video. There'll probably be a little bit less by the time you see it, but they've already shredded through their initial funding goal. They're into stretch goals. They're seven times that initial goal. And essentially what they have are two unique decks that are designed to provide either encounters for you based on locales or decks of loot based on the specific creatures that you're fighting. I really like this because they have a spectrum of loot from rolling a natural one, it's a D20 table, to a natural 20 being the best loot, and then there's varying degrees in between. They also have a variety of loot for creatures you already know, iconic creatures from Dungeons & Dragons, as well as some that are made up by the Tome of Summoning team. They're looking to deliver this in March of 2024, so that's only a couple months away at this point, which is wild to think about. Also, as you can see here from this rotating card, they all have unique art on them, which is pretty cool. So there's over 140 creatures. Some of them, like I said, are D&D based. Some of them are created by the team. Here is that kind of varying degree of loot. So if you roll a natural 20, that's like the best roll. If you roll a one, it's a critical fail. And it says looter is targeted by a reflexive bite attack, meaning you killed the lizard folk in this instance and you're going to loot it and the nerves react and it bites you. Whereas there are, again, a variety of different degrees of loot, which I like this concept. So the better you roll, the better loot you'll get. Again, we see there's a variety of different creatures here in these three decks. And then we also have the encounters, again, based on locales with a D20 table to kind of show you different things to happen. Fit for every level here, right? We have the art to aspire from the front. And then again, the encounter system, a one is a deadly encounter and a D20 might be something a little more useful and a variety of decks for those as well. We have Arctic, Coastal, Desert, Forest, Grassland, Hill, Mountain, Swamp, Underdark, and Urban for four different tiers, right? Well, one to four, five to 10, 11 to 16, and 17 to 20. We also have the very awesome holographic tome here that you can see this binder to keep all your stuff together, as well as super fancy shiny dice. And then the Archmage bundle gives you all of them. I also like, as you can see, the cards that have the loot. They have cards for um, to put on your DM screen to give you, you know, art on the front as well as stat blocks on the back. There's a variety of them, as you can see here. They were also a 2022 nominee for the Ennies for Best Aid and Accessory. And they do have a free PDF sample that you can click and download. Lowest tier will be 25 bucks, and it'll get you the PDF versions of the three decks of loot as well as the encounters. And then again, you can uh, choose to get one specifically if you want them printed. And if you're jumping up, in my opinion, I think the Adept $150 tier is probably the one that I think I would go for here, right? The three decks of loot, the deck of encounters, two tomes, as well as the pocket pages to hold the cards in. But the Mage at 220 is also good if you prefer to have PDF as well as physical and you want those sweet, sweet dice. So again, there are a variety of different levels here, depending on how much you want to back. You can go all the way up into the $500 tier. And then again, we have a variety of different stretch goals that have already been unlocked very close to the Deck of Encounters maps number two. So if you want to get maps for them as well. So again, thank you to Tome of Summoning and the Deck of Encounters and Loot for sponsoring this video. Let's talk giant-based monsters. So first up, we have the Bag Jelly. This is an ooze monster here. We're going to jump over to it once we get there. Here we go. As you can see, this is basically when so much junk has been in a giant's bag, it essentially kind of turns into or an ooze finds its way into 
a giant's bag as opposed to sit it living in a dungeon, it lives in the giant bag. So this is a challenge rating one medium ooze, typical kind of ooze damage resistances, pseudopod attacks that do acid damage and a grapple. Nothing crazy here, just a little bit of a surprise for you when you go to loot the giant's wallet and then find out that there's an ooze inside. We have a Barrow Ghast. I'm trying to remember if any of these creatures have existed before in other iterations. Um, I don't believe so, though the Barrow Ghast does give me pause, as though I feel like it may have existed previously. Let's go ahead and see. No, nope. all right, it's unique to this adventure, or this uh, this book here. So, Barrow Ghast is an undead type, right? A hill giant who dies with an empty stomach makes a Barrow Ghast. As you can see, the gash of the stomach here. So an undead, huge-sized creature, as it was originally a giant, has some undead-style resistances that you'd expect. Has a stench ability. We see this on some other undead, right? Uh, if you're within 10 feet, make a constitution saving throw or be poisoned for a minute. While poisoned, you can't regain hit points. It has multi-attack and a, uh, a life drain attack. So slam for a fair amount of damage, 2d12 plus 5. And then it's life drain. Does a d8 plus 5 necrotic. The target must make a con save or its hit point maximum is lowered by that amount and a humanoid slayed by this becomes a zombie and then has a reaction of noxious wounds immediately after it takes piercing or slashing damage poison sprays out of it which is disgusting uh if they're within five feet they're going to make a deck save or take 3d6 poison damage that's pretty nasty for a challenge rating seven it has the ability to make minions and then also has reactive based attacks and that could be pretty powerful all right, a cairn right. This is a stone giant. It says stone giants believe that the god Scaraeus stone bones inspired artists to create their finest stone carvings. Sometimes a giant pursues this divine inspiration to the exclusion of all other tax, uh, tasks, retreating into cavernous space and blocking out all distractions. Basically, they die in the process of trying to create this art and are a huge undead here based kind of on a stone giant. Um... Not as many resistances here, mostly condition-based, as though it's made out of stone itself. Uh, it makes two slam attacks. It also has a petrifying touch. Again, makes sense for a stone-like creature. 3d10 plus 6 bludgeoning on the slam attack. This is also a challenge rating 9. Uh, thrown rocks, which it still has, a 6240 for 3d8 plus 6 bludgeoning and a chance to knock prone. And then again, a petrifying touch that recharges on a 5-6. Touches one creature within 10 feet. Must make a con save or take 4d12 force damage and be restrained. Um, as it begins to turn to stone, and then again, if it fails again, it will be, uh, is petrified. And there you go. A Cinder Hulk. Distant descendants of fire giants who isolated themselves from the world and steeped themselves in the elemental energy of the plane of fire. Pretty badass looking piece of art, if I do say so myself. Challenge rating 7, immunity to fire, poison, uh, death burst, kind of like we see with Mephits, when it's killed, it explodes. Uh, ten foot radius uh, sphere of cloud and cinders. The area is heavily obscured. Any creature that moves into it must make a con save or take three d six fire damage. The cloud lasts for a minute or until it's dispersed. It makes two slam attacks for two d ten plus five and three d six fire damage. And then has wave of cinders, which is a recharge five six thirty foot cone. Uh, make a dexterity saving throw or take seventy eight fire damage and be blinded. This is, I don't know exactly, I'd have to read more about the specifics of it, but I really like this creature. The art of it is fantastic. Uh, it's an elemental type as well, um, which is good because there's not a ton of elementals in 5e, so that's neat to see. And then we have a Cloud Giant of Evil Air. I believe this is a Cloud Giant that's sort of embraced the Temple of Elemental Evil. Uh, cloud Giants rise in the ordering by amassing valuable and uh, beautiful treasures. Uh, years of successful wagers make Destiny gamblers so confident in their ability to win any challenge, they invite potential rivals to name the terms of the wager. Those who are foolish to issue combat. Doesn't actually say Cloud Giant. Oh, I'm sorry, Cloud Giant Destiny Gambler. I skipped ahead. My mistake. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right, so this is just a specific type. I like this sort of pointy teeth we see here. Destiny Gambler. This is a bard, so it is listed as a bard type here. Uh, all right, immunity to thunder damage has cloud rune. Uh, has a cloud rune inscribed on a mask in its possession while holding it. It has true sight with a range of 30 feet and can use its thunderous clap action and negate spell reaction. The mask has an AC 15 with 45 hit points, so the mask can be targeted itself. Uh, it regains all hit points at the end of every turn, but if it turns to dust, if it's dropped to zero. 
All right, three flying staff attacks, which do a uh, range of 30-90, do 3d6 plus 8 bludgeoning and 3d10 thunder. It says the staff magically returns to the giant's hand immediately after a ranged attack, so it can be used for melee or to be thrown. It does have some spell casting here with a DC 20 saving throw. Nothing too, too crazy that I'm seeing here. And then Thunderclap requires the Cloud Rune. Magically summons a Thundercloud that fills a 30-foot space on a point within 60 feet. It goes around corners. Each creature in the area must make a con save of DC 20 or take 8d12 thunder damage and be knocked prone. You can be heard out to 300 feet. The cloud is also heavily obscured. And then as a reaction, has negate spell, which also requires the cloud rune. When the creature, the giant sees a creature within 60 feet casting a spell, the giant tries to interrupt it. If the creature is casting a spell using a spell slot of third level or lower, the giant or the spell fails and has no effect. If the creature is casting a spell of fourth level or higher, it must succeed on a DC 18 intelligence saving throw or the spell fails. This is very interesting because we talked about this a while ago when they were redoing the Mordenkainen's monsters, saying how they were basically adding the effects of spells into effects and abilities for the creatures, therefore not being considered a spell means that it is immune to counterspell. In this particular instance, this is basically an immune to counterspell counterspell called negate spell which you cannot, if you're casting a spell and it sees it and uses negate spell, you cannot counterspell negate spell because it's not a spell, it's just an ability. And it also has a DC 18 intelligence saving throw to succeed if it's if third level or lower immediately canceled. And then when casting above, it's significantly powerful. This is a challenge rating 19 monster though, so consider that, but either way. All right, Cloud Giant of Evil Air. This is the one I was talking about originally. Uh, so this is one that's gravitated toward the service of Yan C. Bin, the Prince of Elemental Evil Air. Prince of Evil Air, however you want to call it. And challenge rating 12. Uh, it also now has a flight of 40 feet as well as flyby, which can be pretty dangerous, right? It has two scimitar attacks or and one boomerang attack all in one turn. The scimitar does 3d6 plus 8 slashing. And the storm boomerang has a 6240 range. 3d4 plus 8 bludgeoning damage plus 2d6 thunder damage, and the target must make a constitution saving throw or be stunned until the end of its next turn. It returns no matter what, and then has a little bit of spell casting here with the DC 16. Kind of the major one that will be dangerous, it will be probably telekinesis, although fog cloud and gaseous form have the ability to allow it to escape. We have the death giants, a brand new type of giant creature here. Uh, it does say that they have basically uh, ties to the Raven Queen. And then we see the Death Giant Reaper. Fantastic art. I love this sort of lightsaber scythe. Very kind of like, I don't know, giving me like neon punk vibes, but I'm digging it. So the Death Giant Reaper. Challenge rating 12, immune to necrotic and frightened. Makes sense for a Death Giant. Makes two scythe or soul bolt attacks. The scythe does 3d8 plus 8 slashing plus 2d10 necrotic. Uh, and the Soul Bolt has a range of 120 feet, 40, 10, plus 4 necrotic. If the target is frightened, the giant gains temporary hit points equal to the damage dealt. That's pretty powerful. And then Frightening Teleport. Recharges on a 4 to 6. The giant magically teleports along with any equipment it's wearing or carrying up to 40 feet. Each creature within 10 feet of that location, the giant left, must succeed on a DC 16 Wisdom Saving Throw or be frightened. So it's cool that as a bonus action, you can do this teleport and possibly initiate a Frighten to then allow you to use Soul Bolt to get some temporary hit points out of it. And then a jet Death Giant Shrouded one, which is more of a wizard type here. Uh, challenge rating 15 has a death rune similar to what we had seen with the destiny gambler for the cloud giant uh, while holding or wearing the skull bearing the rune the giant can use the reaping scythe action and shroud of souls bonus action uh, it can be attacked and destroyed similar to what we saw with the cloud giant mask um so let's see multi-attack makes three soul burst attacks alternatively if it has the death rune, it can make three reaping scythe attacks soul burst is either a range of 10 or 120, 40, 10 plus 6 necrotic damage. And if the target's frightened, it gains temporary hit points. Or the Reaping Scythe, which has a reach of 15 feet, 70, 10 necrotic damage, and the target can't regain hit points until the end of its next turn. The target dies if reduced to zero hit points by this attack. We do have some spell casting here, but it's mostly utility spell casting. Uh, Frightening Teleport also for this creature as a bonus action. Uh, with a DC 19 on the Frighten, and then Shroud of Souls, if it happens to have the Death Rune still. 
While the giant is shrouded, each creature uh, shrouds itself. While shrouded, each creature that starts a turn within five feet of the giant must make a DC 19 wisdom saving throw, where have disadvantage on saving throws until the end of the creature's next turn. The shroud disappears after a minute when the giant dies or when the giant uses its bonus action uh, again. Uh, uses this bonus action again, so they can re-up it. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, disadvantage on the saving throws, which again, potentially, if you start with that, could be useful with your frightening teleport to then possibly frighten them to allow you to use soul burst to deal uh, some damage and frighten and then get temporary hit points out of it. All right, we have one of the most disappointing things, in my opinion, in this book, which is the dinosaurs. I thought we were going to get awesome new primeval, awesome, like epic dinosaur creatures to use. Instead, we got sort of these prototypical dinosaurs uh, they're, that are basically the ancestor of all dinosaurs based on the type of dinosaur, right? Like sauropod, theropod, aerosaur. I don't particularly love this, especially because we had seen the art of the Circle of the Primeval Druid with a Dilophosaurus, and that Dilophosaurus stat block isn't in here, and Circle of the Primeval Druid didn't make it in either, which is a bummer. But they have cool WizKids minis for them. So, all right, the Aerosaur, an ancient pterosaur. I think the art has been removed because this was some of the ones that had the AI art that we had talked about in previous videos. So we'll go ahead and click it, but I think the art has been... Yeah, there was there is Aerosaur art if you have the physical book, but they have removed that art because of the AI adjustments made to it. But basically, this is a giant, massive, gargantuan pteranodon pterodactyl, okay? It also is not considered a beast. It's considered a monstrosity, which is a bummer. Not that these... I think these are all too high level for druids to transform into with wild shape anyway, but either way. Uh, has magic resistance, and then a bite and a talent attack. Uh, again, there's not too much to write home about these. They're just big dinosaurs that are not considered beasts, so... A bite does piercing damage and can grapple and restrain. Some talons that do 3d10 plus 8 damage. And then because it's so big, it can do wind gusts. Uh, each creature within 10 feet of the air swarms make a DC 20 strength save. On a fail, take 70 10 thunder damage and be pushed uh, 30 feet horizontally away from it and knocked prone. That's pretty cool. Just the, ooh, the wind gust there. Then we have the Altasaur, right? This is a titanic sauropod dinosaur. Uh, like a walking mountain with craggy spine patterns of elemental energy that glow. And again, we have magic resistance. We have multi-attack. Uh, the Ultasaur makes one stomp attack and one tail attack, right? We have the stomp attack does 76 plus 9 bludgeoning damage. Uh, if the target's huge or smaller, it must make a DC 22 strength saving throw or knocked prone. And then it's tail attack, 8d8 plus 9 bludgeoning damage, and the target is pushed up to 20 feet horizontally from the Ultasaur. All right, then we're going to go into a Ceratops, right? This is obviously going to be your Triceratops archetype with your horns, right? It says 200 feet long, enormous nose, horn, spiky, uh, to the end of its spiky tail. So, right, we've got uh, challenge rating 9, magic resistance again. This has a gore attack again because you're going to have your horns. Uh, if the Ceratops moves at least 20 feet in a straight line towards a target immediately before the hit, uh, they're going to take an extra 2d10 piercing damage if it's a creature. I must succeed on a DC 19 strength saving throw will be pushed away and knocked prone. And then has, again, a stomp attack for 4d10 plus 7 bludgeoning damage. And then we have a Regisaur. This is your, uh, this is your Tyrannosaur Velociraptor style prototype here, right? The ruler of dinosaurs, right? A large predator, blah, blah, blah. So challenge rating 14, magic resistance, can make one bite attack and one tail attack. The bite attack does 60, 12, plus 8 piercing, and the target is grappled. Grappled, it's also restrained. It also has a tail attack for 48, plus 8 bludgeoning, and then has a swallow hole mechanic here, right? Huge or smaller creatures grappled by the dinosaur. Uh, if it hits, uh, the grapple ends, the swallow creature is blinded and restrained, and then is going to follow traditional swallow hole kind of rules here. All right, next up is a dust hulk here, which is, what is this? This is an elemental earth kind of based hulk we saw the cinder hulk which is sort of the elemental fire giant this is sort of the elemental earth based giant here we're immune to poison as well as several conditions has an air form can enter a hostile creature's space and stop there it can't move through space it can move through space as narrow as one inch without squeezing which is wild considering it's a large sized creature also similar to the cinder hulk has a death burst mechanic again 10 foot radius dc 14 con save or be blinded for a minute you do get to repeat those saves at the end of your turn. It has three slam attacks where it can replace one of those slam attacks with stinging dust. 
The slam does 2d8 plus 4 bludgeoning, and stinging dust is one creature of its choice. Inside its space must make a DC 14 con save. That creature takes 3d6 bludgeoning damage and has the blinded condition. This one I'm not as excited about as the Cinder Hulk was pretty cool. This one's kind of lackluster in my opinion. All right, the Echo of Demogorgon, right? So this is sort of not, not to be confused ultimately with the monster you fight in Out of the Abyss, although based on the Prince of Demons, right? Some legends claim that the first Ettons were orcs transformed by Demogorgon, the Prince of Demons, while others tie their origin to Grolantor or other god within the Ordening, right? So this is essentially a two-headed, Ettons are a two-headed creature. This one has sort of been blessed in some way, potentially by Demogorgon, to be more Demogorgon-esque, right? This is the D&D Demogorgon, not the Stranger Things Demogorgon. All right, resistance to cold fire, lightning damage, as well as charmed and frightened. Challenge rating six, so a decent mid-range thing, and this is definitely mess up your players if they're expecting to be fighting an Etten, especially if you want to have sort of abyssal um, influences in your campaign. This one's pretty cool. Magic resistance, and then also wakeful standard for Ettens. Uh, it has two tentacle attacks that do 2d6 plus 6 bludgeoning damage and 2d8 necrotic damage. Discordant screams. Uh, the echo directs its friendly howls at one creature within 60 feet. Uh, they must succeed a wisdom saving throw or suffer one of the following effects. You get a choice. Confused reaction. The target must use its reaction to make a melee attack against another creature of the echo's choice that it can see. Or they just take flat out 2d12 psychic damage. I don't know. Some of these, like not the big archetypical ones, like the death giant is cool. But, like, these little, like, alterations to existing creatures are usually the ones that end up being my favorites out of books like this. Speaking of Etten and our lovely world, we seem to be all about mind flayers nowadays, now we in the world of Baldur's Gate 3, the Etten Ceramorph. So, mind flayers, uh, we know about Ceramorphosis, you've played Baldur's Gate 3 potentially, you know all about it, all too well. Uh, you implant the tadpole. Mind flayers have subjected giants to this process in an effort to create larger, stronger mind flayers, but those experiments all ended in failure. A giant's body is simply too large for a single tadpole to take over. Ettons, however, prove to be perfect subjects, and Ettons' two brains provide sufficient food for two tadpoles, and the two tadpoles are able to transform the entity, entirety of the Ettons' body, creating an Etton ceromorph. As part of the transformation process, one of the Ettons' heads sinks into the body, that with that brain focused on controlling the body, the other one focuses on being the brain, which is kind of what you see. There's an Etten head here, and then there's the main one. So this is now switched to an aberration. Resistance to psychic, charm, fright, and stun, and unconscious has magic resistance. It makes one slam attack and one tentacle attack. The Ceramorph can replace one of the attacks with a mind bolt. So we have our slam for 48 plus 4 damage. Our tentacles do 2d10 plus 4 psychic. If the target's large or smaller, it is grappled and must succeed on an intelligence saving throw or be stunned. It does have an extract brain, which is terrifying because this creature is so massive, it can now do an extract brain as well. Uh, again, it does 10d10 piercing damage on an incapacitated creature. If it reduces it to zero, the brain is eaten. And then Mind Bolt at 120 foot range does 2d12 plus 4 psychic damage three times a day, and they must make a DC 15 intelligence saving throw or be stunned. Then we have Fencers. This is a new one for me. Two Fencers bring an offering of food to a hungry devourer that has outgrown her hut. Oh, these are the fencers? Long ago, a brand of forest giants led trolls in a campaign to win Adam's favor. For Yisgard, campaign aspirations quickly failed, but the raiders discovered a key feature of Yisgard. Creatures slain on that plane returned to life the next dawn. Thus, the giants' incursions became a part of the eternal battle that rages across the plains. Fencers' troll ancestry is hardly apparent in their appearance. They retain prominent noses and a hint of green, which we can see here, uh, but otherwise resemble relatively small frost or stone giants. They use armor and weapons similar to what combatants on Yisgard use in the Eternal Battle. Okay, so I thought, based on this art, I thought that they were, like, small-sized, but they're actually huge. Because it's going to be like, oh, that would have been an awesome opportunity for you to have that as a race option in the game. But So here's a Fencer Devourer. That was the big one we saw. Some fencers undergo a transformation. After living in Yisgard, they grow rapidly in height to 25 feet and fueled by an insatiable hunger. Uh, so this is a celestial creature. Interesting. Uh, has a death curse. When it starts its turn with zero hit points and doesn't regenerate, it releases a curse on those around it. Each creature within 30 feet, uh, when it dies, must succeed on a DC 13 charisma saving throw. Be cursed for the next 24 hours. While cursed, you gain no benefits from fin finishing a short or long rest. And at the end of every hour on a DC 13 charisma save, you you don't succeed. You take 2d10 psychic damage. Wow. That's pretty nasty because you can't heal and you're just going to possibly be taking constant damage. 
Regen. The fencer gains 10 hit points at the start of its turn if it isn't in sunlight, because uh, it does kind of have like a photosynthetic look to it. If it takes acid or fire damage, uh, the trait doesn't function. Oh, because it has some trollish nature to it. And it also has sunlight hypersensitivity. It makes two attacks using rend or boulder. Rend is 3, 10, plus 5 slashing or throwing of a boulder for bludgeoning damage and a strength saving throw to knock prone. Uh, if you Oh, I like this. After it throws a boulder, roll a d6. On a roll of 4 or lower, it has no more boulders left to throw. And then we have the Fencer Skirmisher. This one's only large size. That's one of the ones we saw bringing the offerings there. Has the regeneration as well as sunlight hypersensitivity. It has a battle axe here that does 2d8 plus 4 slashing and, or 2d10 if it's wielding it two-handed. Has a magic stone that it can throw, uh, which I guess is more of a spell type thing and ability rather than a physical stone. Uh, it's a toger, uh, 2d12 plus 2 bludgeoning and then again a chance to knock prone. Has mud to stone with a recharge of six. Uh, it lobs a magical mass of mud that splashes all creatures in 30 foot radius. Uh, each fencer creature in that area must succeed on a DC 13 strength saving throw or take 3d8 bludgeoning damage and have the restrained condition as the mud begins to turn to stone. So they basically can throw it, they're immune to it, and they can start basically harden and potentially petrify you with this. And then a little bit of uh, utility based spell casting. Next, we move into Furballs, uh, you know, a again, a race option we have as players. It looks like we are getting with more of the 5e Furballs, not the 3e ones that just look like dudes with red hair. Uh, so we have a Furbog Primeval Warden, uh, which is kind of just like a druid priest here. Challenge rating 4, so again, more NPC style. Has a spear, nothing crazy, or a fire lance, which is neat. A uh, range of 120 feet, 2d10 plus 3 fire damage, and then well as some druidic spell casting. Entangle, speak with animals. Pretty standard utility stuff, although some battlefield control with Entangle. And then again, the Furbog's hidden step, although twice per day, turn invisible until they make an attack roll or force someone to make a saving throw. And then we have a Furbog Wanderer, which is the cleric type. Uh, let's see, two long swords or bewitching bolt. We have a long sword that also does some additional psychic damage. Bewitching bolt, 2d6 plus 3 psychic damage, and the target must make a charisma saving throw or be charmed until the start of its next turn. Some spell casting here. Mage hand, minor illusion, Tasha City's laughter. Nice thing we have to spell magic as well in polymorph. And then duplicitous movement once per day. The Furbog projects an illusory duplicate of itself. So this is almost like, um, Chan uh, what is it called? Invoke duplicity uh, as a tr trickery cleric. Well, this is a cleric, so that kind of makes sense. Can swap places with the illusion. It vanishes after a minute if the Furbog is incapacitated or if the illusion is more than 120 feet away. So it doesn't really do much other than the fact that they can swap places, but it doesn't actually give it any other benefits, and that's a once-per-day ability. We have a Fire Gaunt. Now this looks awesome. A fire giant whose burning hatred prevented it from moving to the afterlife. Okay, so I'm seeing a trend here, right? We're seeing sort of a undead version of a main type of giant. We saw that in the Barrow Ghast and the Cairn, right? Cairn White. We're seeing sort of an improved version of the giant that's like a souped up version. We saw the Cloud Giant Destiny Gambler. We saw the, um, there's the Death Giant version of that as well, which was the Death Giant Shrouded one. And then we're also seeing sort of an elemental version of these, right? We saw the, um, the Cinder Hulk, uh, and then the uh, the Dust Hulk. So this is the Fire Giant Undead version, which is the Fire Gaunt, which looks epic. Um, okay, so this is an Undead, immune to, resistant to Crotic, immune to Fire and Poison. Fire Blood, whenever a creature within five feet of the Fire Gaunt hits the Fire Gaunt with a melee attack uh, that deals piercing or slashing, they take a D10 fire damage. It makes two Heated Maul attacks. Um, this does 3d10 plus 7 bludgeoning damage. The fire gaunt can cause the maul to erupt with crimson flames, and the target must succeed on a DC 18 deck save or take 3d6 fire damage and 3d6 necrotic. It can erupt with flames in this way only once per turn. And then it also has crimson rays with recharge on a 5-6. Uh, it emits a beam from its eyes, mouth, and wounds in a 30-foot cone. Each creature in that area must make a DC 18 deck save or take 78 fire damage. Uh, uh, or half on a fail, or sorry, half on a success. Uh, on a success or failure, the creature catches fire regardless you catch fire. Until the burning creature or another creature that can reach it takes an action to extinguish the fire, you're going to take, you can't regain hit points, first of all, and take a D10 fire damage at the start of each of your turns. That's epic. All right, the Fire Giant Forge Caller. 
This is the souped up version of the fire giant with the rune, right? So huge fire giant cleric, uh, legendary resistance three times per day. This one's a challenge rating 18. It has the fire rune, right? Inscribed on a medallion or some other object. Gives it the magma wave and furnace armor action. It obviously can be destroyed like the other ones. Makes three forge hammer attacks or two heated rock attacks. Forge hammer is 5d6 plus seven bludgeoning damage. Um, uh, hit or miss, the giant can cause the hammer to emit a burst of heat in a 30-foot radius. Metal object in that area glow red hot. Any creature in physical contact with a heated object must make a DC 19 constitution saving throw. On a failure, they'll take 3d6 fire damage and have disadvantage on attack rolls until the start of its next turn, unless it has immunity to fire damage. It can only emit heat in this way once per turn. So it's essentially like an AoE uh, heat metal that it doesn't concentrate on and it can activate it on it missing an attack. That's pretty epic. We have Heated Rock. So we're just throwing a magma ball, basically. 3d10 plus 7 bludgeoning damage plus 3d12 fire. Again, also has the ability to knock prone. And again, roll if you roll a 3 or lower, there's no more rocks to throw. Magma Wave is the fire rune ability here. It emits a wave of magma from a rune in a 30-foot cone. DC 19 deck save or take 8d8 fire damage and be restrained. The creature can make a DC 19 athletics check, freeing itself or creature within that area. And then it also has restraining rock if they get hardened in there to break out. And then furnace armor as a bonus action. Again, if it has the rune, causes smoke and cinders to billow from its armor in a 30 foot radius. While billowing in this way, it has half cover. The armor stops billowing after a minute. So it's just a flat out boost to AC. Oh, and then we're going to guess we're also going to have ones tied to each of the princes of evil X element here. So it's the fire giant of evil fire so this is one tied to what's his name imix uh the fire the elemental prince of evil fire all right so this is a huge giant challenge rating 10 we have shrapnel explosion when it drops to 10 hit points its armor explodes creatures within 10 feet of it must make a deck save or take 66 piercing damage two searing scepter attacks or two bolt of imix attacks the Searing Scepter, 3d6 uh, plus 7 bludgeoning plus 2d8 fire, and the target is magically branded while branded. The target uh, becomes visible if it's invisible, can't become invisible, and sheds dim light. The brand disappears after 24 hours. And then the Bolt of Imix is a ranged attack that does 3d10 plus 4 fire damage, and the target must make a Wisdom saving throw or be frightened until the end of the target's next turn. End of the target's next turn. That's pretty powerful. All right, next up, we have the Fire Hellion here, which is a different option. This is a sort of devil-based fire creature. So this is a fire giant that basically has found its way into the lower planes and joined up with the Blood War. And this is a devil version. We've seen the mini of this from the collector's edition or limited edition box set. Challenge rating 11, magic resistance, kind of seeming to become pretty standard. Soul Taker, though, giant or humanoid that is reduced to zero hit points by the Hellion dies... Uh, and its soul rises as a Lemure, which is the kind of undead or the demon goop kind of slobby creature on Avernus, one of the nine hells in a D4 hours. If the creature isn't revived before then, it can be restored to life only by a wish spell or by killing the Lemure and casting true resurrection on the creature's body. So if you get killed by this thing, you better bring them back fast or they're going to be a devil and then their character is basically gone. You can make two Morning Star attacks, which do 3d8 plus 7 piercing plus 2d10 fire. If the target is a creature, it can't regain hit points until the start of the Hellion's next turn. And then it also has Infernal Orb. It hurls a magical ball of fire that explodes in a 20-foot radius sphere centered on a point the Hellion can see. The sphere spreads around corners. Each creature in that area must make a DC 17 deck save or take 48 fire and 48 necronic half on a success. Next up is the Flesh Colossus. That is absolutely terrifying art. During the dawn of the giant's empire, Twisted Minds sought to make their fallen comrades continue their service. Wizards, giants stitched and wove the flesh of various giants over an adamantine skeleton, creating this absolutely disgusting monstrosity you see here. All right, so we have pretty much a ton of immunities, pretty standard for most constructs at this point as far as uh, this one's lightning poison and then bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magic. Uh, berserk, if the core inside of the Colossus is destroyed, the Colossus goes Berserk. On each of its turns while Berserk, the Colossus attacks the nearest creature it can see. If no creature is near, it attacks an object. It basically just goes crazy. Uh, the Colossus is immune to any spell that would alter its form. Magic resistance and siege monster for double damage versus objects. It makes two fist attacks, which do which have advantage if it's Berserk. 
3d6 plus 7 bludgeoning. If the target's larger or smaller, uh, it is pulled up to 15 feet towards the Colossus as a 20-foot reach. It has the grappled condition, and it is also restrained. Has elemental breath on a 5 to 6, uh, recharges on a 5 to 6. A 90-foot cone, DC 21 deck save for 98 damage of a type of the Colossus is choosing, acid, cold, fire, or lightning. And then uh, at the same time as the Colossus releases the exhalation, creatures inside the Colossus's chest cavity take 98 force damage. Because I guess it does have a swallow hole mechanic here. Bite. Uh, one larger, smaller creature grappled by the Colossus takes 3d8 plus 7 bludgeoning damage and are swallowed. And then it has, uh, you know, more or less the standard swallow mechanics. You're going to take force damage at the start of each of its turn. Uh, the chest cavity can hold up to two creatures, though. Inside the chest cavity is its core. That's how you can attack it to do the berserk thing. The core has 140 hit points. If the core is destroyed, then it regurgitates you. But remember, if you're inside, the breath weapon deals damage to you as well. Next up, we have the Fermorians. These are the sort of what you typically think of the big hulking purple creatures with the evil eye. But I hear we also have one in here that was before they were changed. I don't know if we have R here. This is how beautiful they used to look before they were transformed to look more like this. So first up, we have a Formorian Deep Crawler. Uh, this is a Formorian whose body is adapted to crawling through the tunnels of the Underdark. Uh, challenge rating 10. Contortionist. It can enter a space large enough for a large creature without squeezing. It's normally it is huge size. While it has the prone condition, crawling doesn't cost it any extra movement. In addition, the prone condition does not give advantage to attack rolls against it. It also has spider climb. This is terrifying to think about. Think about your art you see of a Formorian and then imagine it like contorting and crawling through tunnels and on walls. <laughs> no thank you. Uh, two slam attacks and a crawling hex. Crawling hex is recharge on a four to six. Uh, targets one creature. The target must make a wisdom saving throw or take 78 psychic damage. Have the prone condition and become cursed for one hour. While cursed in this way, you cannot stand up or end the prone condition on yourself. And again, it has the 3d6 or 3d10 plus 6 slam attack. Then we have the Formorian Noble. Again, this is before they were sort of banished and cursed, that you could see here. Uh, Wizards, challenge rating 15. Uh, three rod attacks, which do 3d6 plus 6 bludgeoning plus 2d10 force. And then we obviously have a lot of spell casting here. Uh, chain lightning, cone of cold, fireball. And then beguiling presence. The Formorian targets a creature it can see within 60 feet. It must succeed on a DC 17 wisdom save or have the charm condition for one minute. They can repeat the saving throw at the end of their turns um, whenever it takes damage. If the target saving throw is successful, the target becomes immune to all Formorian's beguiling presence for the next 24 hours. Um... So yeah, I think these aren't like unique. I think this is just like showing what they were beforehand. I don't think this is saying that they've like shifted back. Occasionally they return to the material plane. Oh, these are, they left. In their arrogance, these Formorian nobles unknowingly escaped the dreadful fate of their kin and they remain unchanged in their remote enclaves. Ah. And then Formorian Warlock of the Underdark. Um, challenge rating 12. It has a blood rune. This is sort of the improved version of this. Uh, they can do the corrupting hex and poisoning rebuke action. Also has Devil's Sight to see in Magical Darkness and Legendary Resistance. We have Multi-Attack, three Great Clubs. If it has the Blood Room, it can replace one with Corrupting Hex ability. The Great Club does 3d8 plus 6 Bludgeoning plus 2d6 Necrotic. The Corrupting Hex requires that Blood Room. Picks a creature within 60 feet. Target must make a DC 16 Charisma save or take 68 Necrotic and become Cursed for 24 hours. While Cursed, its speed is reduced by half. If it tries to cast a spell, it must make a DC 16 Intelligence check or the spell is wasted. Eldritch Burst also is uh, magical energy. Explodes in a 20-foot radius sphere centered on a point of its choice within 120 feet. Each creature in that area must make a dexterity saving throw or take 5d12 force damage and be knocked prone. So again, kind of almost like a sort of like a, a force-based fireball, but with a prone condition activation. Then we have some spell casting here. Spells of note would probably be suggestion and telekinesis. Uh, creeping Gloom recharges on a 6. It momentarily conjures Grasping Darkness in a 30-foot radius sphere uh, within a point 120 feet from itself. Each creature in that area must make a Constitution saving throw or take 2d10 necrotic damage and have the Blinded Condition until the end of its next turn. And then lastly, with the, with the rune here, Poisoning Rebuke. In response to being damaged by a creature, the Formorian can see within 60 feet. It forces that creature to make a DC 16 con save. On a failed save, the creature has the Poison Condition until the end of its next turn. We have a Frost Giant Ice Shaper. This is the sort of souped up Frost Giant with the Ice Rune um, that gives it the Ice Wolves and Ice Armor reaction, legendary resistance on this 
guy as well. Makes three Great Axes, uh, Freezing Ray, or any combination of the two. The Great Axe does 3d10 plus 6 slashing plus 2d10 cold. The Freezing Ray has a range of 120 feet, 3d8 plus 4 cold damage, and the target must make a con save or be restrained. And even if they succeed, their speed is still reduced. I like this ability, Ice Wolves. Uh, it magically summons 1d4 wolves made of ice that use the Winter Wolf stat block, um, but they are elemental uh, in elementals instead of monstrosities. They appear in unoccupied space within 30 feet. The wolves take their turn immediately after the giant. On the same initiative count, the wolves gain a plus six bonus to their attack and damage rolls while they're within 30 feet of the giant, and they disappear after a minute. And then we also have ice armor. When a creature the giant can see makes an attack roll against it, the giant can form a coat of ice around itself, granting itself a plus six to its AC uh, against that attack. After the attack hits or misses, the ice shatters, and each creature within five feet uh, must succeed on a DC 18 deck save or take 3d8 cold damage. Sort of like an armor of Agathis, but slightly different. We have the Frost Giant of Evil Water. Again, this is the one that's sort of joined up with... Uh, what the hell is it called? All Hydra, the Prince of Evil Water. Or Princess of Evil Water, I'm sorry. Uh, gets immunity to cold damage. And Amphibious makes two battle axe attacks. 3d8 plus 6 slashing damage. Uh, plus 2d6 cold. or And a harpoon attack. The harpoon here is a range of 5200. Uh, does piercing damage and the grapple condition. While the target is grappled, its speed isn't reduced, but it can't move farther from the giant. The target takes D10 slashing damage if it escapes from the grapple or if it tries and fails. And then I can reel them in as a bonus action, pulling them 20 feet towards it. We have the Frost Morn. This is the undead version of a frost giant. Um, let's see. Vulnerability to fire, immunity to cold and poison. Uh, has a bunch of undead immunities here as well. It takes one freezing touch attack and one icy axe attack. It can also replace one of those with a polar ray attack. Freezing touch is 48 cold damage plus 48 necrotic. If the target is reduced to zero hit points, it instead drops to one hit point instead and has the petrified condition turning into a frozen statue. If the statue takes bludgeoning damage, it shatters, killing the creature instantly. If the statue would take fire damage, it instead takes no damage and thaws, ending the petrification. That's a weird kind of mechanic there. Uh, Icy Axe does 3d8 plus 6 slashing plus 2d6 cold, and then the Polar Ray is 5d10 plus 4 cold damage, and the target speed is reduced by 10. It also has a reaction of Blizzard Escape. Immediately after Creature, the Frostmourne can see hits it with an attack roll. The Frostmourne momentarily dissolves into a Blizzard, reducing the damage to itself by half. It can magically teleport to an unoccupied space you can see within 30 feet. And lastly, we have the Fury of Kostachi? I don't know how you pronounce that, but this is sort of the demon frost giant, it looks like, right? There are frost giants who struggle to rise in their ordering, along with those who reject Anum, sometimes turn into the worship of the dis demon lord, and then they're blessed in such a way. Uh, they are considered a fiend and a demon. Resistance to fire, lightning, and poison, immunity to cold. Chilling Aura, a creature that starts its turn within 10 feet of the Fury, must succeed on a DC 20 con save or take 2d10 cold damage. Uh, magic resistance, and then two fist or rock attacks. The fist does 2d8 plus 8 bludgeoning, plus 3d6 cold, or 5d6 cold if the target took damage first from the Chilling Aura. And then it can throw a rock with 60 to 40 range for 40 uh, 10 plus 8 bludgeoning damage. And then as a bonus action, it can charge to move its speed towards an enemy. Whew. All right, that was just about an hour. See, this is why I didn't do both of all of them together, because it took us 40-something minutes to get through all this. So anyway, that was A through F of the new monsters in Big Beast Glory of the Giants. Uh, I'd like to say that the dinosaurs were my favorite, but they aren't. I think the Fire Gaunt, uh, the art really helps sell it. I really like that. I like the concept of the fencers. I wish they uh, were playable race, but they're obviously a little too big and have a lot of downsides to them. Uh, I think the other one's probably the Etten Ceramorph. I just like the lore behind it that, like, you can't, you know, tadpole a human or can't tadpole a giant because they're too big, but you can put two in an Etten and then make a Mind Flayer out of it, which is pretty cool. So anyway, thank you to Tome of Summoning and Deck of Encounters and Loot for sponsoring this video. There'll be a link at the top of the video description as well as the pinned comment if you want to go and check that out. Uh, it's also a tracking link. So if you click on it, they'll know you came uh, from Nerd Immersion. So anyway, thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you next time.